Good evening from Salamanca in Spain. I would like to express my gratitude to Michael Woodward for his generous invitation to contribute to this timely event in the midst and in spite of the challenges of our present moment. My congratulations and my thanks are also extended to everyone who has made it possible and in the first place to Christine herself. I met Christine Jensen Hogan at a Merton Scholars Retreat sponsored by the Thomas Merton Centre Foundation to which we had been invited as part of a group of 13 participants. The retreat took place at Bellarmine College, now Bellarmine University, in 1996, between the 21st and the 25th of February, and it included a one-day stay at the Abbey of Gethsemane. Christine presented her play in the morning of Saturday the 24th. In the profile of the participants, Christine had written about herself. I have stolen time in the wee hours to refine and rewrite what seems to be a book of my poems, to delve farther into the novels of Jane Austen, the book of Isaiah, and to consider the revisions of my play about Thomas Merton and Anne Bradstreet, to whom I will always feel that I have not done justice. I suspected and soon thought otherwise. After the retreat we kept corresponding, not intensely, but always with warmth and mutual appreciation. And eventually she kindly sent to me the script of her play once it had been staged at the Merton Society Conference at Oakham, England, in 1998. Her play had crossed the Atlantic and perhaps the time was ripe to reach audiences other than the Anglophone. In a handwritten note, Christine had added, Fernando, thank you for reading these. I appreciate any suggestions you might have. Suffice to say that my response to her included the possibility of having it published in Spain and my offer to translate it into Spanish. A short exchange on this common dream would come to fruition two years later. You're very welcome to this unique event, the first online performance of Christine Hogan's play. You may have read that I helped her stage it at a Thomas Merton conference uh, back in 1998 with only a few hours for rehearsal. By contrast, this performance came only slowly and shyly into focus. I'd always kept hold of the play as meeting Christine, albeit briefly, and staging the play alongside her remained a treasured memory for me. When lockdown hit in March 2020, the tight script fell out of a drawer. I was moved to run it past our actor friend, Katie Giorgio, who fell for it. I was already wasting my corona time recreating some classic Merton photos, which seemed easier than the amazing old masters then going the rounds. So I thought we could rehearse in costume. It was a small step to add backgrounds on Zoom and Katie, with great patience and professionalism, led us over regular weekly meetups towards what I hope is a coherent performance here tonight. I was shocked and saddened to find out online that Christine Hogan had died in 2007. Google showed that she had made a connection with Fernando, resulting in a Spanish publication in 2000 of the play. Fernando Beltran Lavador is a well-known name in the world of Thomas Merton scholarship, so I thought it good to reach out and let him know what I was doing. Well, Fernando's enthusiasm for what we were doing took my breath away and an immensely fruitful collaboration was born, resulting in his translation becoming Spanish subtitles and to a further connection with Professor Carmen Manuel, who brings a great understanding of Anne Bradstreet to the panel this evening. I'm very grateful also to Reverend Dr. Gary Hall, who has been around the British Irish Merton Society since its inception and has written, edited and spoken about Merton uh, widely. There's no one I could turn to over here who is better able to illuminate the background to the play. Before the curtain rises, I want to thank one more person without whom this evening would not be possible. I've seen Matt Wadley grow up over many years, helping out with sound and vision gear at conferences and developing into a maestro of technology with the coolest, most laid back can do affect you could possibly find. 
Matt has brought all that to bear on our project, so we owe him an immense thank you. That's enough from me. Now it's over to Thomas Merton, very excited about his new publication and Anne Bradstreet wandering somewhere in the Kentucky Hills. I hadn't before realized the rage and exuberance of this writer, the gambler in the cassock, <laughs> the veracity for all things human and the will to write his appetites on stone and offer the tablets to the void and hope that the void can weep. Gambler in the cassock. <laughs> Gambler in the cassock. Veracity for all things human. Well, well, uh, John Leonard, I see <laughs> a bit of the poet, <laughs> but not too much. Uh, maybe not enough. <laughs> oh, my. They finally published it. 28 years, but they finally published it. <laughs> Thank you, John Leonard. Yes. I do hope, I do hope most sincerely that the void can weep. <laughs> 28 years, half my life, <laughs> more than half my life. <laughs> I was never any good with numbers. <laughs> when I behold the heavens as in their prime, and then the earth though old, still clad in green, the stones and trees insensible of time, nor age nor wrinkle on their face are seen. If winter come and greenness then do fade, the spring returns and they more youthful made. But man grows old, lies down where once he's laid. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh! I've wandered too far. It would seem so. I have definitely wandered too far. Indeed. I yes, indeed. Uh, some sort of um, college prank? Um, invade the monastery? <laughs> she seems a bit, uh, bit too old for that. Uh, Madam, mm -hmm. uh, what are you wearing? <laughs> I thought this was the 20th century, and uh, besides that, it's summer. <laughs> I know it's summer, sir, and I know this is the 17th century in New England, where no one dressed as you should be. Oh, I thought I looked um, rather charming, um, sort of debonair. And uh, this is Kentucky, <laughs> not New England. And is this Kentucky, a, a new settlement near Boston? I, I haven't heard of K Kentucky. Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's um, that near Boston. Uh, somewhat west and a, a good way south, actually. I got lost in a popish settlement. I didn't even know there was one in America. They don't deal kindly with Protestants. Popish <laughs> settlement? <laughs> What is this? I must go back. Back to the 17th century? 
to New England. That's a, a long trip. Where am I? Catholics, the Inquisition. Oh, why do I wonder so? This is worse than being found by the Indians. <clears throat> this is too absurd. Me, a Puritan woman, and you uh, uh, lost in a popish settlement in, in, in K -K Ken Kentucky. Kentucky. <laughs> Yeah. Who are you? <laughs> I'm not. I. I. Look, look. I must return home. Look, I am Father Louis. I have a father, sir. His name is. Do you have a more common name? Uh, Merton. Uh, Thomas Merton is my uh, more common name. Um, Oh, why? Oh, that's right. You're a Puritan. So names like um, Patience or uh, Perseverance. You're probably Perseverance Smith or something. I, sir, am Anne Dudley Bradstreet. Oh, okay. Okay, then I'm, I'm John Milton. <laughs> I thought you said your name was Father Louis or, or Mr. Merton. Oh, yeah, but if, if you can be Anne Bradstreet, then um, I can be John Milton. Or uh, Dante. I'd, uh, I'd prefer Dante. <laughs> you are not Dante. Dante lived hundreds of years ago. Ah, uh, well, so did Anne Bradstreet. Oh, <laughs> uh, why are you in this costume? Halloween isn't here yet, and you missed Mardi Gras. <laughs> Although they would have loved a Puritan at Mardi Gras. Oh, no, not a, no, not a good choice for Mardi Gras. Uh, no, Godiva, maybe, or Marie Antoinette, but um, no, not a Puritan, no. I do not know the people of whom you speak, and, and as for my costume, it is quite appropriate, I can assure you. You, sir, in that garb are, are terrifying. The Inquisition, they wore your robes. Actually, um, I believe they were Jesuits. <laughs> Do I look like a Jesuit? <laughs> a Jesuit? Oh, I, I guess I do. Oh, well. <laughs> look, the Inquisition was a while ago, and our racks and um, bum screws, they don't work. Uh, they're old and rusty. They wouldn't work satisfactorily now. <laughs> we, don't you have to join the other monks for prayer or some other ritual uh no i'd like to know why you're here i was reading the paper and having my lunch and you showed up to disturb me i thought i was alone sir i never disturb people at lunch or at any other time i was tired and stopped to look at the fields maybe she's crazy <laughs> She seems harmless. Kind of interesting. Um, look, our, our fields are beautiful, aren't they? I love to wander through them myself. If you're tired, you could stay and rest a while. The monks and I, were farmers, not inquisitors. We are a gentle lot. We won't harm you. It is very, it is very lovely, so... So peaceful, so fertile looking. We plant some of it. Uh, much of it is left as woods. I, I like that. What would the elders say if they knew I was here? Well, I won't breathe a word to them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what would my fellow monks say if they found you here? Father Louis and a loony Puritan. <laughs> I'd love it. <laughs> I thought you did everything as a group. Don't you need to go and join them? Well, no, I'm, I'm a hermit of sorts. <laughs> Just a little of my day is spent at the monastery. The rest of the time, I spend alone so I can write. Oh. Oh, you write? They've given you a place just so you can write? They gave it after I badgered and scowled and complained for years. <laughs> I've wanted a room of my own in which to work. 
but my household is so busy, there is not a spot for that. I think I'd feel quite selfish to badger for it. Yeah, I, I suppose I am selfish. <laughs> no doubt you compensate for your selfishness by writing lengthy prayers and enormous theological and philosophical arguments. Are you accusing me of uh, being a bore? <laughs> I'm not a bore at all. I, I, madam, am a gambler in a cassock. <laughs> Some people think I'm a theologian. Uh, you like poetry? Yes. You probably think that quite frivolous. Most strict religious people do. Well, I'm, I'm not considered that strict. <laughs> Uh, clothes don't necessarily make the monk, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I write poetry. Of, of course. course. Um, so do I. <laughs> you, you probably write very dogmatic lines about punishment for sins and how good it is for us to suffer. I've had quite enough of that. It's funny. I always thought your poetry, um, because you're a, a Puritan and all, would be about suffering and sin and dreary, gloom your way to glory nonsense. It isn't. Um, uh, some of it is quite touching. You, you know my work? Yes, I do. You, a Catholic priest, know my work? Uh huh. <laughs> but you see, my own people in our town, sir, say things to my children, to my family about me wasting time. I should be doing constructive things, important things. They say my hand and needle better fits than a pen. I'm, I'm sure you'd do very well with a needle, but uh, for poetry, that. Um... That lasts longer than needlework. I shall remember that when I hear their comments. Oh, I must be going. It's getting very late and there are wolves. Wolves? <laughs> but yes, w wolves. Oh, oh, you don't have wolves at the monastery. Perhaps you, you ate them or frightened them away. Uh, we're, uh, we're mostly vegetarian. <laughs> Do you know of St. Francis? Uh, he'd be on our case pretty, pretty badly if we did any harm to them. But um, no, we don't seem too bothered by wolves. But in Boston, there was quite a problem. And in Andover, there still is. Wolves in Boston? Ah, ah yes, Harvard wolves. <laughs> I've met some of them and... I was a Columbia wolf myself in uh, New York. Ah, uh, that's um, New Amsterdam to you, madam. <laughs> yes, I guess we did, uh, we did cause a few problems. My son is at Harvard. <clears throat> I really must go back. Well, look, what if I walk a little way with you? just to make sure you don't get lost again. It might be hard finding your way home. Yes. Yes, it might. The land is beautiful. But the buildings, they're so simple. They're not so grand as the abbeys in England. It isn't ominous or strange at all. Perhaps we've learned some of the simplicity of you Protestants at long last. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Your summer is warmer than our colony in New England. Yeah, why, uh, why don't you take off your hat? It must be hot under there. M my, my hat? Oh, no. I, I don't believe you asked me that. No, I, I couldn't possibly take off my, my hat. <laughs> uh, well, there's some, some shade over, over here. Come and, uh, yeah, come and see, 
Come and see the graveyard. You can mark your graves. Of course. Don't, Don't you? you? Oh, we, we did. At first, when we settled. So many died that first year. And the Indians were so curious, they would dig up our dead. I've always known Indians to be most respectful of the dead. My dear friend, Lady Arbella, is buried in our woods and it's impossible to find her grave. She'd been so kind to me in England at the castle. I can't find her grave now. It's such a terrible thing not to be able to find somebody's grave. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know it is. And we were on that ship. Oh, how I hated it. I didn't want to leave England. And all I knew and loved, but the king was so silly with his taxes and more taxes so he could fight wars far away. We left because they, they wouldn't pay, my father and Simon. I've known of uh, people leaving this land in, in protest too, uh, against the Vietnam War. V Vietnam War? Uh, yeah, in, in uh, Asia, uh, the Orient. They went north to Canada, some of them, so they wouldn't have to fight across the world for something they didn't think made sense. Uh, it's a hard thing, having convictions. Now look at that. Father Louis. <laughs> Another Father Louis. Must you even share names? <laughs> uh -huh. Share names? Look. No? Why? Oh. Oh. Oh, I see. This was someone to whom you, you were close? Uh... Yeah. Yeah, you could say that. We we were somewhat close to him. <sighs> it's uh it, it's me. <laughs> it is. You know. Well, it, uh, it looks like a pretty fair possibility. The, the monks are not inclined to put out fetching little markers such as this for uh, no reason at all. But I... You, you really are... And Bradstreet, aren't you? Of course. Well then, well then that explains everything. <laughs> Let me see the date on that. A uh, December 10th, 1968. <sighs> Well, then I'm 350 years old. <laughs> well, you, you don't look a day over 300. <laughs> well, the, what is this? Why? I don't understand. <laughs> uh, well, you, you say you were wondering when you saw me. Yeah, yes, I, I was. I, I, I don't remember much. And I, I, I wander these woods, uh, wandering souls, perhaps. Um, what, uh, what some call purgatory. In our religion, you were either one of the chosen ones or you weren't. I guess I wasn't. Or maybe if I'd helped Sarah. Who, Sarah? Sarah is my sister. She was not so prudent, so clever as I was. She had a great passion for life, for understanding things. 
she questioned our faith mildly, very mildly. My husband, her husband and her father, my father, they cast her out of the colony. My father granted her husband a, a divorce from her and gave her only the very least to live on. She married again, a ghastly, crude man, and she became the brunt of people's jokes and the point of a lot of their stupid lessons on following the rules. What did you do? Well, I did nothing. I don't believe that. No, and really, it's true. I said things to my father about God's love and gentleness, but all he talked of was duty and rules and honor and commandments. And then inside myself, protected from, from the rest of the world, I, I came to believe that if my father's view of God was true, then I'd rather there was no God. If he could treat his daughter so harshly, so cruelly, in the name of religion, then... then I... It wasn't God. <laughs> Religions and so-called religious people sometimes have less of God in them than many of those who call themselves atheists. And you, you, a monk, can say that. Oh, how I wish I'd been able to talk to you before. Well, I don't go back quite that far, but it might have been interesting. I believe in searching for answers. I don't just like to accept things without understanding them. So what did you do? I tried to see Sarah a few times, but she avoided me. I think she didn't want me to be troubled by the people in the colony. I began to take long walks. And then? And then that my writing became very important to me. My poetry came more and more from the heart and not just my head. Sometimes it almost wrote itself. I know what, I know what you mean. Oh, one day when I was walking, I was very tired and I looked around at the fields and the sky and such a love, such a, a gentleness came over me, and I, I can't explain. But I thought, if there is a God, this is the way he would show himself. Not in power. And then my fears about life and all began to lessen. Well, you found what took me years of study to understand. <laughs> When I came here, I'd uh, pretty much lived on my own since I was 15. My parents were gone. I really lived. I traveled around Europe alone. I became a bon vivant. <laughs> I drank, uh, caroused. So you came here to pay for your sins? No. I came for the discipline, the stability. I wrote about it in my early life. Um, the Seven Story Mountain. That's what the book is called. People seem to like it when uh, seedy characters find their way. Anyhow, the book sold well, real well. So you couldn't save yourself? Uh, no, I couldn't. Uh, not then. It's still hard for me. When John Paul, my brother was killed in the war, the Second World War. A world war? The whole world at war? Oh, I can't be. Oh, John, sweet John Paul. <laughs> uh, he was younger than me, worshipped me. I, I treated him so badly. I thought he was a nuisance. I can still see him standing there outside the clubhouse the other boys and I had made. We wouldn't let him in. He just stood there watching. God, I, 
I hope he died quickly. I hope he, uh, I hope he didn't hurt. Sweet brother, if I do not sleep, my eyes are flowers for your tomb. And if I cannot eat my bread, my fast shall live like willows where you die. If in the heat I find no water for my thirst, my thirst shall turn to springs for you, poor traveler. Where, in what desolate and smoky country lies your poor body, lost and dead? And in what landscape of disaster has your unhappy spirit lost its role? Come, in my labor find a resting place, and in my sorrows lay your head. Or rather, take my life and blood, and buy yourself a better bed. Or take my breath, and take my death, and buy yourself a better rest. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, if I, if I hadn't been here then, I would have slipped into those old habits and drunk myself to death or something. <laughs> Speaking of drinking, and this, uh, this may sound silly for a dead man, but I am hungry. <laughs> of course you are. I disturbed your lunch. <laughs> Are you hungry? It's been about 350 years since you've eaten, hasn't it? I, Thomas, am starving. <laughs> well, now, um, there is bread, hearty brown bread, uh, or wine, or, or, or do you drink wine? Uh, what difference does it make? Have a little wine, uh, cheese, lots of cheese about. <laughs> Well, would you look at those monks, sanctified eunuchs, running away from life. Just look at them. Uh, oh, madam, oh. <laughs> I'm certainly no eunuch, <laughs> sanctified or otherwise. You don't fit the mold here. Did you never meet a, a woman who turned your heart to thoughts of love and home and family? I didn't know there was a mold here to fit. <laughs> I, I was callow, uh, wild, I guess, before I came here. There were a number of women, but there was one long ago. I wrote poems for her, but I would have been a terrible husband, a wretched father. I was so self-centered, and uh, I'm happy here. You don't seem self-centered. <laughs> I, I must have mellowed, <laughs> like the cheese. <laughs> Did you know? Did you know we make cheese? Ah, this cheese is stupendous. It has a nobility that is certainly unheard of anywhere else in Kentucky. <laughs> Most people in Kentucky don't understand really fine cheese. <laughs> uh, I think that we should never freeze such lively assets as our cheese. <laughs> The sucker's hungry mouth is pressed against the cheese's caraway breast. A cheese whose scent, like sweet perfume, pervades the house through every room. A cheese that may at Christmas wear a suit of cellophane underwear, upon whose bosom is a label, whose habitat the Tower of Babel. Poems are naught but warmed up breeze. Dollars are made with Trappist cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so they think that poetry is frivolous. <laughs> oh, like some of my people. And you make cheese. Yeah. I'd like to go back. I'd like to see my family. 
I wonder if they're wandering too. If this is purgatory, how long does it last? Ah, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe it's different for each of us. Do you know what heaven is like? Uh, not exactly. I, I haven't tried it. <laughs> but I read somewhere that, that hell is um, not to love anymore. So I've thought that heaven would be to love and to be loved and to know it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, lunch? Lunch. Would you, uh, would you come inside and help me with the china and the crystal? Oh, oh I don't, I don't think I, I, I should. I, 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 I couldn't. I... Really, I am a monk and a dead monk at that. <laughs> this is lovely. Ah, now, before you can eat, <laughs> before you can eat, you must read my review. Oh. I was reading this when you came, uh, my book, my book about the whole world without love, it's in print. <laughs> they finally published it. I carried it around for over 20 years. And then now this man is reviewing my book. What an odd looking script. It's not at all pretty. <clears throat> now, does gambler in the cassock mean he likes it? Well, he must like it, he goes on and on. And you say it's about the world without love. It's, it's like, like, a, like a diary of an imaginary trip I took, uh, my argument with the Gestapo. <laughs> It's a journal about um, escaping from the... Um, escape? Escape? Yeah, there was a, a group of people who wanted power for themselves and only themselves. Not much different from your king or any other oppressors except in scope, except in their vast, vast scope and their evil. I wrote it in 1941 when war was brewing in Europe. I had lived there and I loved it so. I began to see in my mind what could and sadly what did happen. My body was in the nice little town in upstate New York where I was teaching. But my soul, my soul knew. I saw the pain, the desolation, the refugees, the prisoners, victims, horror the emptiness. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, now I'm, I'm disturbing your lunch. No, 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 you're not. I've lived through quite a lot of upheaval, political upheaval in England. My father talked a lot about it. So did everyone in our house. Now, why didn't they print your book when you wrote it? I think they didn't want to risk offending some government officials. <laughs> here or in Europe and that really was quite ridiculous of them. <laughs> what government official would read Thomas Merton? <laughs> what government official reads? <laughs> oh. why, why did you want it printed now? Ah, uh, because the guns are bigger now. <laughs> much, much bigger. And people need to know that it isn't power that brings peace. No, no, it isn't. Here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's in, um, it's in searching for truth, in, in integrity. In love. <laughs> The Heim, madam. <laughs> to life. Oh. To le bon Dieu. To the good God. 
to you. <laughs> to you. <laughs> Now, would you care for some cheese? <laughs> oh.